Perfecto. We find ourselves here in the 209th session of the Mosh Pit. I'm Jamal McNeil with Rework with a C, and I'm here with my co-host David Gray with Colliers. And together, we stretch the canvas for the Mosh Pit tribe made up of global organizational professionals interested in workplace. We have a few goals. We want to get outside the U.S.-centric mindset. So our tribe members come in from the U.K., Germany, Austria, um, various countries in Asia and Africa, and we're and Mexico, Canada. Can't leave them out. Precious tribe members. Um, we're just grateful that each of you come every week to discuss topics ranging from CRE markets in Africa to applied anthropology in the workplace. We've also touched on metaverse, AI, and several other hundred topics. And we're so grateful that you join us each week to run through these. And really, I believe we can change the world one workplace at a time. I wanna draw your attention to a couple customs of the mosh pit. One, the chat, pay attention to the chat because our tribe members are illustrious authors, um, extremely talented leaders and professionals. Um, and and clinicians and social scientists and always drop all kinds of resources in the chat that you're going to want to pay attention to over the course of the weekend and the next week and weeks to come. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is the people's elbow. It's always delivered with love. This is a safe place. We do uh, allow challenges to thoughts, ideas, concepts, and we discuss them further, drive deeper into them. So be aware of that. And it's always delivered with love. Um, other than that, Mr. Gray, did I leave anything out other than mention of the after party at the top of the hour where you're spinning on the ones and twos? That's the one thing. You, this was going to be the first time that you made a mistake in over 200, 209, as you said, 209 episodes. You always picture perfect. I, I emphasize the chat. In fact, I'm going to give a demo of how the chat works. Uh, Jamal? This is our YouTube link that I just dropped in the chat. You can uh, immediately listen to a two minute trailer of you and I for just our 10 seconds, not these full two minutes that, uh, or two minutes in your case, four minutes in my case. The four people that speak in the trailer from the episode 93 are four of my favorites. Love everybody here today. Those four as well, love quite a bit. They're absolutely dynamite. And uh, it gives you a perspective did listen to what happened two years ago in one single mosh pit, what Genentech said, what uh, was shared by Twilio, what was shared by uh, uh, Standard Charter Bank, and bump, bada, bump, Mitsubishi Bank. So you got the number 20 and number 40 bank financial institutions in the world saying, here's how, here are the challenges that we're having workplace. They do it in two minutes. I don't know how our video editors do that but this is recorded and truncated down to two minutes you can also go through that link take a look at last week's flex index you heard me uh, forecast that it's going to be the most significant data game changer and it's already happening they have an ai add-on jamal i played with the chat gpt that they've worked into this reservoir of data where everyone's sharing their policy let's say everyone uh, a majority of the fortune 1000 it's off the plate. We just hear uh, at this gathering and across the globe, there's too much information flying around. We don't realize how fast things are moving. But I wanted to get that, that plug in for uh, Rob, the CEO and co-founder who we won't have access to in a few more months because he's just going to be, you know, uh, buried behind the major shifts that are happening. In two weeks time, three weeks time rather, Jamal, we're going live. We're going to San Ramon, California, and here's the registration for it. So you can just check the Zoom later, save your chat. And if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area on the 19th, you want to come over to uh, the uh, Tri-Valley. We have a radius-like uh, set up there. Now, let me put you on the spot. Since you're here today, you're our facility host for that. What's in store? Oh my God. Okay. Well, I wasn't expecting this, but yeah, I would love to just have you guys over. We are doing a mosh pit at my place. And um, as David said, radius like, but maybe not as cool, but it will be cool and fun to have everyone or most of you in person, whoever can make it so that we can actually uh, have much deeper discussion too. 
You're welcome to come in early if you want to, anytime after 10 and stay after March bit as well, work from here or not, or take a call, take work from a desk room or stuff. So there's enough places for everyone to interact, collaborate, or do focus work, but it will be, it will be fun. I love it. Thank you. For, I'm excited. Uh, if if uh, the mosh pit at Brian Elliott's was any precursor, I'm excited to get over there. And uh, thank you, Netta. Appreciate that. Mr. Gray? Yeah, that's perfect, Jamal. And we had a great time in the Noe Valley area at Brian Elliott's. And uh, uh, I'm really excited about getting out to San Ramon and kind of getting back into the routine of a live mosh pit on a quarterly uh, basis. We've done it in New York and uh, uh, in the village, if you will a couple of times over the last four years. And now I'm doing pole planning, right? I threw a, a dart out to July 19th. Here's a dart pulling forward uh, to the 12th. Take a look at the chat. That is a awesome website, uh, Patrick, putting you on the spot for her in just a few seconds. Um, really excited what you showed Jamal and I about, you know, we may change our our whole linkage process of the zoom and, and go to the environment that you have in store for us. Give us a little mm -hmm. teaser. Yeah. Thank you, uh, David. Yeah. Imagine a place where you could activate connection, trust and commitment in minutes where every one of us would feel truly seen and heard as a human being, where we all knew where we were going, how we're going to get there. And everyone valued and appreciated my personal contribution, a place full of joy and energy, hope and optimism that you could trigger in five minutes or less. You're invited on the 12th of July to experience a first of your kind replacement for all of the video platforms of the world, a place where true human connection prevails at the end of the day. Thank you. Back over to David. That's dynamite. Jamal, we're going to be replaced. There are a couple of hot anchors going already. Uh, we're going to get right to it today. Thanks for everybody's uh, patience. Video editors, do your very best to take the last six minutes and turn it into 22 seconds max. Um, Sophie, you've written a couple of books. Uh, you have a very British accent, and you're a, you're a, a LinkedIn top, top uh, <laughs> You know, what does that mean, uh, being a, a top voice on LinkedIn? I actually don't know. Um, I spent a lot of time. Uh, oh, stop. Sorry, I'm getting some pings. But um, I, I actually don't know. They don't quite define it. It probably means I'm spending too much time on LinkedIn. I do actually have five courses on LinkedIn as well. Um, but it it means that. I'm I'm spending a lot of time contributing, commenting, sharing, posting, um, and as I said, I have I do have my courses, so which are about empathy, future work skills, and oh, those pesky Gen Zs. I love it. We'll later uh, drop as you're uh, talking or uh, wrap for a group engagement. Uh, drop your uh, the link on your two books. the The idea of hitting some of those traditional threads that we've sort of wound through several times in the mosh pit of the multi-generational workforce, um, the, the connect, the engagement of coming forth, having technology in place, uh, having policy, like we'll be discussing on July 19th, the right policy in place for a distributed work environment. Um, you're gonna go through a lot of that, but make sure that the, the book references are, are present for us. And with all of that, I'd like to, I'd like to officially hand over the reins, mute everybody else, and begin the Sophie Wade talk. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jamal. And uh, hello, everybody. Let me get this going. Let's put this in uh, play from the start. Okay, can everybody see that? Okie doke. So, where are we going and how are we going to get there? So um, mm, I must make sure I can see the chat because what I want to do first of all is I want to ask some questions. Can people, if I if I have the presentation up, can people see the chat? That's my question. Yes, if they choose to do so, they can uh, click on the chat and on their screen, I have a large one in front okay, of Okay, got it. I've found mine too. Okay, perfect. So the question is, 
First of all, because the future of work is lots of different things. And um, that's what we were sort of really talking about, the essence of, of where we're going and and uh, and how we're going to get there. So the question one is, and just to drop your answers, it was the pandemic, the cause or an accelerator, just because there are lots of different, both an accelerator and accelerator for sure. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Next question. Whoopsie. Next question. Is the future of work here or is it on its way? Is it coming? Oh, 15 minutes. Both. Accelerate, accelerate the trigger and accelerator. Both. Okay. All right. So it's here, both ongoing, ongoing here and evolving here, coming freebie is <laughs> somewhere in the middle. Okay. Excellent. Uh, what portion, this is a harder one. What portion obviously this is approximate, of the future of work, ways of working is location-based. How much of it is about location? 50, 50, 20, 40, 25, new technologies, half, okay, 60, 30. See, okay, now we're getting some really interesting range. 60, 40, depends on business strategy. Love that, okay. Zero, okay, all right. Next one, what percentage of executives do you think understand the future of work? The big picture, because if you said 50-50, then it's not all about location, right? 3%, 0 0.005, okay, great. So what percentage? Uh, how many percent of executives? Not many, 10%, less than 10%, okay. All right, yes, 10%. <laughs> we obviously have very high uh, opinions of, of executives. Yes, I agree with you that it's pretty low. One last question. What aspects of the future of work are, are CEOs most focused on now? And please, no, not, we're not allowed to say productivity. Um, or, or AI, or AI. ROI, engagement, engagement, okay, building utilization. Attendance, oh, yes, cost. All right, so interesting, hybrid, attendance, connection. So interestingly, we have particularly on how much location is part of this focus and then what people are focused on and what people should be focused on and how much they actually understand the big picture. So the point about this presentation is about the big picture, really. So first of all, what is the future of work? Now, the top one is kind of my uh, description that I have in my second book about the future of work, which came out in 2022. My first book about the future of work came out in 2017, and I rushed it out because I was so sure that the future of work was just about to arrive. And I believe, and I will make lots of statements, <laughs> um, and these are my opinions. I'm not the only person who does believe that the future of work is here already, as obviously many of you do, um, almost all of you do. Um, but here, ongoing, whatever it is, it's, it's there are still people who believe that we're on our way there, that it hasn't arrived yet. So, you know, the issue is that we we don't all have the same opinion. We're all dealing with a situation which is very much in flux, moving, it's um, and multidimensional, multifaceted, and that's the biggest challenge with it. In fact, Gartner has this description here. The future of work describes changes in how work is done over the next decade, influenced by technology, generational social shifts. I don't necessarily agree, agree in, with that totally, but that's sort of where we are. We, we, we have, we're coming at it from different perspectives and different opinions, and this is the challenge that we're dealing with. So for me, the future of work really arrived as a, because of the uh, accelerator, the pandemic was an accelerator, and because of so many more um, uh, technology integrations that happened when the when the um, pandemic arrived. So let's just say you know early in 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 you know let's say March, April, May, June. You know as all these new technologies were coming in place, so that we could work differently because of having to work in a much more distributed way and under pressure and uh, facilitating things to be automated so there weren't manual handoffs in order to be safer. That was what really accelerated the arrival of the future of work. And I love to use this picture of the future of work because it really, for me, captures the essence of it's flexible. It's about flexibility, even in a suit. Um, there's time pressure. It's being done anywhere. And there, um, there's a sort of, uh, there's, 
the, 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 the urgency that we're thinking about, we're looking at in terms of how much technology, you know, what we're having to do, where we're having to do it. Um, this is all, it sort of really captures the essence of, of what we're doing. <laughs> Uncomfortable. Well, he looks pretty, he looks pretty comfortable, in fact. So, but there are many, many different ways that the future of work is affecting us because it's, it's, I want to step back a bit and sort of look at the environment that, that, that we're dealing with, because so much of it is, as, as Gardner also says, it's, it's technology driven. There have been societal, societal shifts. For example, we're, we're retiring later. Um, and we have economic reasons, for example, back in the in the 50s and 60s, 67 percent of homes, one person, uh, only one person had to work outside the house, the home in order to, to support the, the, the household. And now really it's the it's the inverse of that. So 70 percent of um, households with um, kids under 18, both parents need to work. So more flexibility is needed in how we're, we're needing to work in different ways because of some of these societal and economic changes. So that that is sort of some of the 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 other elements that are are involved in future work, but a lot of it is technology driven, and who is joining or what and who are joining our workforce and sort of adding to the the, the blended workforce that we're dealing with. There are also many more devices that and that that are giving us cap different capabilities and how we're using the devices and the different services that we're providing, new sources of revenue, how we're actually being able to individually create our own revenue streams um, and be able to you know, the influencers and, and all of that, the create the, the, the sort of separate um, and in parallel creator economy that's developing. These, the first two photos here are photos that I took on planes. One is a, a young woman who was obviously bored with what she was doing. And I've seen several people actually multitasking by watching TV whilst they're doing their work. And another one was a, a woman who was on a uh, a conference call um, on the plane. So we're working very, very different ways. And now we're going to be working with AI, how that's going to be affecting us. Uh, I don't actually think it's going to be annihilate, you know, eliminating full jobs for the most part, but really changing so many jobs. Um, and we're going to be seeing sort of how, you know, it's going to take us a few years to really see how that's all, all the different contours of uh, um, and characteristics of how that's going to change. The key for me in all of this, that it's really, I do see it's being driven by technology, but it is it is us, it is the talent, um, it's the human aspect of it in terms of, of people who are using that technology, both as customers uh, and customers who we are needing to pro provide um, products and services to, as well as, um, of, um, as uh, us as employees and how we're needing to use that technology in different ways and the different the products and, and, and tools that we have in the platforms in order to be able to, to do the work that we're doing. So. Just going to go through the environment, the enterprise the employees to sort of take it from the highest level down to to the sort of personal level. The environment is a really critical piece of this because I think one of the the essence of where we're going is for me, I see that we aren't where our environment is. And that's one of the the challenges that we're dealing. That's why the strain, there's a strain in how we're we're challenged by how we're trying to adapt for and work effectively in this new environment because we're not there yet. Um, and we haven't adapted enough to be able to deal with the fact that our customers are changing, their demands are changing. And we can actually see that ourselves in terms of how differently we're working now than we used to. Um, if we think about um, oh, bye, Deborah. <laughs> um, in terms of, for example, since the pandemic, I stopped going to the gym. I now have an exercise bike at home. So that gym member, the, that gym is now trying to sort of get me back to, to go back there again. And then needing, and I'm obviously not the only one, that we're all trying to sort of see how our new rhythms and cadences of how we work are changing. How much am I, am I going to my co-working space where I office? but also joining other different people in different co-working spaces because now they've changed the business model. So you can go for, for days. There, there are lots of different ways that we are changing our products and services and how we're giving feedback and how, you know, in a SaaS environment, 
it's interesting to see that people are having to work really very much along the value chain. Um, we saw that really a lot in the pandemic where um, I was interviewing the woman who, uh, the CEO of Crazy Richard's Peanut Butter and going from the manufacturing, so the whole, the, the manufacturing plant to the people who are distributing it from the wholesalers all the way to the, to the, um, the, 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 the retail stores where they were actually trying to put the peanut butter on the shelves, everybody was taking a hit all the way along the value chain as they were trying to meet uh, the, you know, the, the, the needs during the pandemic to all, all trying to sort of see what they could do in order to be able to pivot sufficiently working together. Now that hasn't changed um, since the pandemic. Obviously the, the sort of volatility that we're dealing with has gone down. But we're looking at supply chains, diversifying our supply chains, not having you know as many products necessarily um, uh, being produced in China. Trying to do them, you know, di having different sources that we're we're relying on, but be able to take into account if there are different changes that we need to be thinking about. So this idea of customer feedback loops, being able to respond, being able to have to be to respond faster. Um, and and more to to our customers' needs and how their behaviors are changing. This is really critical in terms of our marketplace because it's also as as these changes happen, it may not be necessarily in your business or you're introducing some technology kind of like, oh, we can update it, we can use AI like that, but it's also your customers. So how are your customers, sorry, and your competitors, how are your competitors, what technology are they embedding? How does that change how they're providing their, pro their products and services? And then their customers may be changing how they're um, sort of interacting with their, their service provider, which then may again take customers away from you. So you then have to adapt. So this the uncert the cycle that we're having to, to sort of up level to is much faster based on all the, this, these rapid changes. And this was all before November 2022 when AI threw another sort of spanner in the works and really ratcheted up the, the pace. So this let the speed that we're needing to deal with and the uncertainty of how things are progressing is not going to slow down anytime soon. And that really changes how what our businesses are needing to deal with, the, the complexity of the issues, the speed with which they're needing to sort of look at how we're working. We need to be collaborating in ways that we never did before. We actually had quite linear, sort of static, independent ways of working, doing many different projects and tasks. But now, or rather tasks, but now we're having to work much more in teams. We're having to work across disciplines. Let's say coming up with a minimum viable product quickly. If you think about in the past, Windows 95, Windows 97, there were these sort of like big product releases two years or two or three years apart. In 2020, Zoom released 400 new features and functionality over one of the year, over, 20, over the one year. Now, obviously that was a very, you know, a, a very challenging year for us all. But that hasn't changed. And you'll see the, whether it's Teams or Zooms or, 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 or Google, Google Meet, there are so many different changes that are happening, not just with obviously video platforms, but all kinds of software that we're now used to getting all these incremental updates on an ongoing basis. That's how we're working now. So this is fundamental to, to the way we have to shift our, our thoughts and, and be thinking flexibly and adaptably and kind of like how we're needing to pivot because that is the nature of work. So the technology has changed the very nature of work requiring us to be bringing di different disciplines together, the complexity that we're dealing with, the project economy. So in uh, 2021, the end of 2021, the Harvard Business Review said the project economy has arrived. So the data they gave was that Germany um, from 20, uh, 20, 2009 to 2019 when I can't remember what the starting place was, but um, it went up to now in 2019, 40% of German GDP is based on projects. That's a very different way of working. So we, and, and a lot of this is non-routine projects. Again, we've automated, all that technology has automated away the, the sort of mundane, the routine stuff that was sort of easy to do. So we're left with the complex, the issues, the, the, the more complex problems that we're needing to deal with that's requiring us to work in teams, that's requiring us to work on many different types of, 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 of situations, dealing with different issues than we have before. So that is requiring, that is requiring us all to sort of up-level how we're doing things, how we're approaching work. So work itself 
has changed. And we're needing to adapt. <laughs> so we, we are adapting to these ongoing changes. We And we're seeing that our, our you know, let's just say our customers there, or, or, you know, on the average uh, tube journey, tube journey, what do I say? The subway journey in New York, so many people are watching TV shows on the subway, or we at now have all these telehealth services, which had, which uh, so many physicians had been so against prior to, to the pandemic. And now, of course, that is a, you know, a regularly used and, and facilitating um, uh, services to so many people who are remote or in, in rural areas. Um, so there are lots of different change of behaviors. And of course, this photo on the right, we know how much the office space and, and commercial real estate is changing with all the, the knock-on effects of that. So that's the big picture. Am I talking way too fast for anybody? <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Okay, perfect. Okay. So the enterprise. What does that mean for the enterprise? Well, a lot of this too, if work has changed, what does that mean? And um, I will not say, for the most part, I won't say digitized. Um, digitize is basically saying you have a map, it's a physical map, you digitize it, it go, it becomes, you know, a digital version of the analog. Digitalized is that we are, the process has changed. So in in taking something to the digital environment, you actually change how it, the, the work is done. And that is something which was done in a in a rough, in rough kind of like, let's just get things done type of a way during the pandemic. And that, this is where we need to sort of step back and look at how we're doing things. Um, in my first book, I actually used the example of Uber. Um, and Uber, obviously, way, way prior to the pandemic, but didn't say, let me try and sort out a better um, uh, business model for for taxi companies. Because in fact, if you were living in New York and it was three, three four in the afternoon, and it was raining and you want to get to the airport, it was a horrible experience. The taxi, the whole taxi service did not work for the consumer. Uber said, let me think about how we can actually make this a much better experience for both the, the, the customer and also the taxi driver, although the car service, because that actually is another customer. So they can see each other so that they know what they are. So take, looking back, looking, sorry, stepping back and using first principles to say, now we have all this technology, how can we actually do this differently? What would be the best way to provide products and services in order, yes, use experience and, and design thinking, absolutely. So this is this is how so many people have yet to to look at the how of how they're doing business and then the how of work and and looking and sort of defining and re and redefining um, and then refining and doing a lot of iterations in order to get to the place where they're actually doing they're actually providing the, the, the products and services in the way that really needs to be done now, not using the sort of legacy ways of doing things. Yes, all kinds of incredibly important expertise and experience that can come to the, come into the, to come to play, but really co-creating, looking at what we can do now and doing it differently based on where we are now. And, and as I said, this, the speed, the uncertainty um, and the, the, the unpredictability of how we're needing to move forward because we don't know how customers are going to change. We don't know how ourselves we are still, you know, interacting and, and reacting to some of the changes that are going place are going on. And AI obviously is changing so much. So we need to be able to always be ready to, um, to pivot, to be able to be thinking about things in different ways and not ever be thinking like, okay, we're done with that. No, we have to keep evolving. Everything needs to keep evolving. And flexibility, yes. <laughs> so this is you know, finally where the workplace comes in, but actually the location is only one piece of it. The schedules, there's hours, there's shared jobs. Um, uh, obviously people on site, I never want people to, to forget people who have 100% on site jobs. There's so much flexibility that can, that can be offered to them and it needs to be, doesn't have to be identical, but it has to be equitable. So everybody really is included and everybody, because as human beings, what we need is we need autonomy, we need to have some control over our destiny so that we can actually work out how we work best. And this is really important because for every business, they need every single employee to be doing their best work. And so that is absolutely critical. When we're talking about engagement, you said the CEOs are focused on engagement. Well, we really need 
people not just to be, you know, I, I'm not going to use the, the QQ word, I can't stand it, but we need people to be leaning in. We need people to be excited about what's going on and how we need to be adapting and bringing their best ideas because we are dealing with a much more challenging workplace or rather business operations more challenging. And yes, connectedness, the culture. It, we need actually to be thinking about culture in a very, very critical way these days. Um, Dan Smolin is here. He was very kind to introduce me to somebody who is like the guru on onboarding, who has now told me that his first book sort of said culture was important. His second book about onboarding said it was important. His fifth book now said culture is the only thing. So culture is so critical to be bringing us together or feeling that we're together wherever we are with purpose, alignment, anchoring, inclusive. And that risk tolerant piece of it, this is really about um, forgiveness. It's if we're, if people feel safe and people feel connected and they have trust-based relationships, well, I will kind of try and get to empathy at the end, but we can, people need to be able to be forgiven. They need to um, be able to, to take risks, make mistakes, make reasonable, take reasonable risks, um, make mistakes, learn. And that's the way in this challenging environment, we're going to be able to, um, <laughs> yes, George Brad, exactly. Well, he was kind of, he was kind of going to be teasing that. So, um, yes, yeah, so we need to, to have an environment where people are comfortable, that they can bring as much of themselves as, as reasonable and, and be sort of leaning into it and feel they can speak up and they can contribute and they feel safe and they have that, sen that sense of belonging because otherwise they're not going to be able to do their best work wherever they're working from. And people need to feel included wherever they are. So we're, we're looking here and thinking about, yes, this distributed workplace, the distributed workforce, wherever they are which we've had for years now. If anybody who's had, you know, multiple offices, they've been dealing, you know, they've been working in a distributed way for a very long time. Now we need to learn how to do it. Um, so it really is a question of, and this is one of the, th the challenges I find is that we, which in fact, Jamal and I were talking about very recently is the, how we're working now is so different that it really requires learning and, um, and leaders, big change in how leaders need to be uh, thinking about how they're actually overseeing people. It's much more about coaching. It's much more about helping people, uh, sort of giving people more responsibility, helping them um, sort of up level to and, and, and upskill, giving them clar clarity. One of the reasons that I find that apprenticeship as the model of having to, you know, not, not just onboard, onboard someone, but to sort of teach them how to work is because, and this is no criticism, this is an observation about how people worked in the past, myself included, I, I learned by watching somebody else and just sort of working it out and asking for some indications, kind of like, oh, that, we need to be much more deliberate and purposeful and clear about exactly what is demanded and what is needed. And without being micromanaging, in an environment, remember, where we are still making it up. There's so many things now which we're making it up as we go along. We're, we're, we're coming up with the best idea and we need everybody's contributions. So that clarity, the transparency, trying to understand exactly what it is that we're trying to do and how we're going to accomplish it is really, really important. This delegation. So very interesting research that was done in 2016 by SAP and can't remember whom. Um, and it was called Leaders 2020. So it was done in 2016 and they were looking at what they called digital winners. So some of the companies that had um, incorporated uh, digital, um, you know, the digital sort of digitalized and um, ahead of other people. And who do they think, who are they looking at to see who's going to be most successful? And they saw the ones had actually, the ones that they, they saw sort of forging ahead were the people People who are re the companies that are really um, decentralized decision making because you don't have in the, at the speed with the, the, the lack of predictability now. More decisions need to be made really close to the front line by some people on the front line. It, it, it was too slow to bring all the information back up to the top, make the strategic decisions, and then get it back out again. So that requires leaders to be more over do with more to be overseeing to be coaching to be helping people understand what they need to do and be pushing out and down that decision making not very comfortable for a lot of people so this is this is uh, another challenge and another challenge and of course we know very much that 
to do with distributed work, the results focus makes a big difference. But we need to be thinking much more about performance than presence, right? We need we, we don't want necessarily want people to have to be in person. That doesn't make any sense. Thinking about all these different things that we're, we're looking at, the location is got is 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 this much of it. It is we need people to be working in the best way possible, wherever that might be, and be supporting them. So focusing on results. Now that is obviously harder in some uh, in some situations. Um, but that shift to, to results focus and outcomes focus also helps us try and understand what it is that we're trying to achieve and really have some clarity about that. Co-creation, I think, is one of the most important words these days because it really helps in the word itself bring us all together bring across generations because and I wish I had more time to talk about the different experiences in terms of the younger generations who typically, or the younger workers who typically have, have had more time, are more digital natives. They've had more time just to play with technology. You know, my phone, it's, it's, I, it's functional to me. If somebody gives me a new app, great, I'll try and learn it, but I don't have time to play. And I, so I don't have as, as expansive an understanding of what technologies might be out there that I could use in different ways. So bringing the different generations, the experience of older generations and the younger and the younger employees and who are coming sort of new into the workforce, who don't have set ways of doing things, who can think more expansively simply because they don't have as much experience, that co-creating together is going to give us so much more um, ability to move forward and, and bring new ideas and, and ways of doing things into companies, um, into our businesses and to, to move ahead. Um, yeah, so, so co-creation, huge word for me. And I really like the idea of co-creator because I think it's rather than employee or asset or human capital or human resource. But if we're all creators, whether we're actually inside an organization or outside of it, it actually sort of puts us on a, on a level playing field. <laughs> Um, recognition is very important for supporting people. Um, so communication. So here we go to some of the methodologies, live asynchronous documented. Um, I My new um, podcast episode, which came out today with um, the woman who, who basically led virtual first at Dropbox. Really interesting that their, their lead is asynchronous by default. So their, their policy is virtual first. Um, and then asynchronous by default, we all need to be learning how to maximize our time and how we're working and how we're working together so that we don't have to be wasting time in meetings where not everybody needs to be there. Um, we need those trust-based relationships. We're not afraid to lose, to, to miss meetings um, and using, you know, whether it's, you know, all the different tools so that we can do, do updates in different ways. Careers. Now, this is where there is a big difference between different generations because how careers work has, has really changed because of technology. So companies need to be, which I should have put in a word earlier, companies are much flatter now. I think HBR or maybe it was Deloitte said that optimally like three to five layers, but there used to be 10 plus layers that you would incrementally go up the ladder bit by bit by bit over the course of your career. Somebody terrified me by telling that, me that at AT&T there was a sort of a, a chart on the wall which showed all the different levels that they would go up. Now, if it's flatter, you can't go up incrementally over time in the same way. So you need to go horizontally or you need to go diagonally. Now, this is challenging because most companies, only 33% of companies, this is LinkedIn data from January, actually have internal talent marketplaces in place. It is very hard. Companies have been set up without even sort of having to think about it for you to go up this, these sort of levels incrementally. You can't do that. If you don't want to lose people, you're going to need to move them. Um, yes, Dan, they are a journey. So you need to be able to move people around. Um, I was uh, working with some a company in the um, senior living space. Now, they they only basically have three levels. And how do you do that? You know, giving people projects, giving people side projects, allowing people to share jobs and, and sort of uh, and rotate a bit so that people had different experiences, could be learning different skills and not want to leave the company. Right now, because companies aren't set up to be able to move people easily internally, it is extremely hard for larger enterprises to do that. They're leaving. Only one in five employees believes, uh, finds that their company um, or their boss actually is able to facilitate them sort of, you know, moving up and or getting 
progressing their career in their organization. So that's a huge challenge. We also have retirement being delayed. Um, I think retirement is unhealthy physically, mentally, and it's not good for you. So um, I think fractional retirement is a good idea, um, but we're needing to have our savings last longer. So that is going to be changing the dynamics. And it's going to be helpful to have people who don't have to sort of go from 100% to zero. You lose all this knowledge from, from companies, which we need to be doing this co-creating co together. Now, finally, to employees, how are we doing? For, am I doing for time? Probably badly, but um, employees. So we know that job security, there is certainly in this country, and it is challenging in other countries as well, certainly in the UK. Um, but you don't, it is, it is true that only really in the US do you have the same huge challenge, um, maybe some countries in Asia, actually, um, in terms of the, the lack of job security. And that is particularly for the youngest employees, that is a huge source of, of financial, uh, of stress, of mental health um, issues because of financial stability. So that is something, and this whole this whole thing, you know, the youngest employees, they're not loyal. Well, you know, tenure does not equal loyalty. Ten, it, it, loyalty used to be sort of because you, there, was a, there was a quid pro quo. I have job security, I have a job for life, that's the loyalty and I'll put in these hard long hours. If you're not going to give me any job security, why on earth would I would I stay working for 70 hours a week? Because what am I getting out of it? Unless you're actually upskilling me, because that is something that is really important. Upskilling, you will find that so many of the youngest employees coming into, maybe coming just out of college or out of school, are focused on upskilling. Why? Because they want to stay competitive. They if you or just coming into the workforce, or you're trying to sort of go up the ladder, and you're trying to have financial stability, you're going to be focused on skills, and, you know, just gathering new skills. So one that you can be sort of, you can be more, feel more secure in your job, but also then if you go somewhere else to other, um, to other places that you actually have the, have different skills can be used in different ways. And doing some work on the Gen, Gen Z's, it was really interesting that a whole bunch of um, Gen Z's in their mid twenties didn't have any idea about what they wanted to do for their career in five to 10 years time, which really surprised me. And then I started sort of looking, digging deeper into it. And of course, if so many jobs are coming up out of nowhere and out of the top um, 25 fastest growing jobs that LinkedIn reported at the beginning of the year, seven out of the top 10 didn't exist 20 years ago. So if you're if you're in your 20s, you're not going to decide in your career now because who knows what jobs are going to be coming up. And right now with AI, who knows what um who knows what a particular job is going to entail and do I want to do that? So right now just gathering skills is going to be really really important to uh find out be able to be in a position to choose which direction makes sense and make, might have the most security. Um, you know, there are a lot of different things that we need to be thinking about when we're trying to attract it as a young person into our organization and help them grow within the organization. Remember that talent mobility is also an issue too. Blended workforce, side hustles. So large percentage, whether it's 30, 40 or 60 percent, Previously, as I've said, 60% of Gen Zs and, and millennials had size hostels and also 36% of Gen X. That was that is in the UK is in the US. But the side hustle for the most part, for most young people, they're doing it because they need extra, they need it to pay their rent and they need it to pay their sort of basic expenses. And also it is for financial security. So if I have a portfolio career, if I have multiple clients, if I um, am a freelancer or maybe have a part-time job, but I have I have different people who I'm getting revenue from, then I don't, I have more income security. So that's the kind of that's how the younger, the younger folks are thinking about work. It is not one employer because that's too risky, but very specifically in the in the US. But generally, the idea of work is not kind of like I'm, you know, I'm I'm in a company for life because that doesn't exist anymore. So that's a very different way of thinking about work. And if you think about again this, um, the the way new jobs are appearing, so so much is changing, and so that's where we have this a really interesting disconnect between um, much older 
uh, folks in the, in the in the workforce and younger. I don't want to say generations because we're all different. But we have very different experiences and perceptions and understanding of work. And what does that mean in terms of how we're all working together? Now, obviously, mental health issues, we need to be thinking about um, our mental health, particularly because if you have some two really, really interesting books. One that I do recommend, one is, uh, they're both by Alvin Toffler, who wrote Third Wave. He wrote it in the 1970s and um, in the 1980s, Third Wave and Future Shock. Now, Third Wave basically predicts all of this. Um, the digitization going from the, in the third wave, so the first wave is agrarian, the second wave industrial revolution, and the third wave is this, this digital revolution. And the whole point about, so he sort of predicts all of this going from scale and, and massification, he calls it, and all these, the, all everything's being centralized down to technology and being able to um, approach the customer of one, being able to have flexible work. But future shock is basically saying, this is all too much for us. Human beings don't deal well with this much change. So this is where some of, I would say that, a, a, a large amount of the younger employees who are saying, you know, hang a second, you guys are so stressed out. And we don't know, we don't know where we're going yet. We're trying to, to get there. We're trying to move this forward. So we really need to be more balanced generally as we're going through this extraordinary period of change. We're needing to, to step up. We're needing to upskill. We're needing to, to raise the bar and be really engaged. And at the same time, interesting conundrum, to be more balanced and be able to make that life fit, you know, have that flexibility so that we can do the things that we need in order to keep ourselves, you know, mentally, uh, mentally uh, fit and, and balanced as we're going through all this change. Yes, climate change doesn't, have, oh my goodness, climate change as a an undercurrent for the our youngest workers um, who think about it a lot, that is a destabilizer from the very, from the get-go. So, you know, community, these are just some of the things that can be done to really sort of connect people um, within the, um, yes, agreed, Brown, the, 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 the stress, there are, there are lots of things that we're dealing with right now. So, um, it's a community and shared experiences. So, I will do, I will do, I'm just trying to, do, 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 to change one. So, all of this gets me to empathy and um, Jamal, David, can I just do three minutes on empathy? I think we definitely want to spend a lot of time on empathy after we pause. Okay. Right now okay. Because you, the, this data dump in my piece yes. of his brain is, is, is pushing out. And there's so many different threads. We've had a tremendous amount of, of comments. And this is, you, you really have, have drawn from a lot of current things. I want people to raise their hands uh, if you'd like to pick one of the particular threads. And then we certainly, at the top of the hour, we'll uh, wrap with a little bit of uh, uh, empathy. Jamal, what landed for me uh, was a, a couple of different things. I like the flat org chart because the, people are pushing in that direction. Yet how do you move people around uh, in roles to get more experience so they can potentially mm -hmm. grow, develop, right? Um, th th that was one of my favorites. Uh, did anybody else have a, a favorite? Uh, Stephen Butler in the house, always good to have a Canadian. Jamal loves Canadians, please. I put I put my hand up too early, so go to someone else. Sorry, I was responding to your last piece. I'll hold it there. Hey, okay. A couple of times, Patrick, uh, who will be with in uh, two weeks from Berlin, has said, uh, you know, it's about the love, and we don't really have a lot of communication. And in meetings, sometimes if we don't reaffirm the values of the company, the values of a terrific, successful culture, like all companies should strive for, you know, we don't have that that team engagement, whether whether someone's up on the screen or right next to us. Well, just, so I just I just like to, to 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 frame how I think about empathy because it's so important because it be, it came to I didn't start off with empathy and kind of go, oh, we must be kind and nice to each other. That's not what I'm talking about. For me, it came as a solution to how we're needing to change, how need, leadership is needing to change 
I having to think and understand our teams, our team members more, what stress, what they can handle, what they're dealing with, how they how they're reacting to stress. Um, between generations, it started off with trying to understand millennials. I put myself in millennial shoes and tried to connect with what how they were seeing the world and what they were experiencing. So that's and then I was also prior to the pandemic was also dealing with this decentralized workforce and remote working. So putting yourself in somebody else's shoes when we're trying to deal with so much and trying to work out like what engages David? How is how am I going to get David, who's on my team, to work? to work more or, you know, how can I understand what projects he wants to work on because I'm actually thinking and putting myself in his shoes. So that's how I think about empathy. It is very practical. It's, it's a value, it's a mindset and it's skills. Uh, let's go out of order to Patrick on the subject of empathy. Hey, had her hand up before I did though. So I know that's okay. I said, that's why we're going to go out of order. Oh, you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to yeah. jump in front? Yeah. Okay, I'm a Southern gentleman. Pay, I apologize. <laughs> I got pulled up front here. Well, I want to just call out, first of all, Sophie, it is a lot of great stuff. And it, and, and the way you've ordered it and structured it and the way you, you bring it across in the speed that you did. Uh, and I just spent 12 months in the UK, so I kind of was able to hang with you. It, it's tremendous. I, I want to give you kudos for that. I can feel the passion and the energy underneath coming from deep conviction based on you seeing so much. And I want to applaud that first and foremost. Thank Big you. Time. Okay. And then secondly, um, you know, things are moving so fast. I'm a baby boomer, you know, I don't get it, but things are moving so fast. And at the speed of the way things are moving, we keep losing touch with each other more and more, actually. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we, we were still closer. We're just getting further apart, right? And, and, and I want to call out that with all the things that are going on, we almost give no attention to the only thing that truly connects human beings with each other for the last 250,000 years. And we wipe it from the table. And it's, it's kindness and caring. And, and I think that we have an opportunity, right, to, to take all this stuff that's taken a lot of our space, our mind space and our time space, move it a little bit to the side because it's going to keep moving fast and ask ourselves the question, if we've got 10 hours in a day, are we going to take a chunk of that and start taking better care of each other than we have in the last three, four, five years? Because if we don't, we're going to lose the little bit that's left. And I think, and, and, and I just want to bring it into the room conversation that um, there is an opportunity. Um, and I'd, I'd argue that uh, we should be spending half of our time on this topic and let the other half go to hell. That's, this is hillbilly talk. Let the other half go to hell and let's put half of our attention on keeping our friends, friends and, and caring for them, uh, please. Thank you. That's my that's my five cents. So so Patrick, I, I so so glad that you brought that up because I you've you've mentioned this before, and I would actually challenge you that you say that we have lost connection. I don't think I haven't found that we had that connection in the workplace. We did outside the workplace, but we came with two dimensional cutouts. We had this whole phrase like, it's not personal, it's business. You weren't supposed to be connecting and trusting and all these wonderful things that we're trying to talk about now. I believe that we have the opportunity to actually bring empathy and connection and relationships and trust in then, because we never had that in the workplace before. It was this kind of like, you had a, had a job for life and that was it. So for me, this is an incredible opportunity to change the dynamic we need to, because we need to work more closely together in teams and on projects and all that kind of thing. So that is actually giving us an opportunity, I think, and yes, we need to work at it for sure. And we need to spend a good amount of time on it, giving us the opportunity to work together closely and have strong relationships in ways that we never had before in the workplace. We may have a double elbow because I'm going <laughs> to elbow your elbow, Sophie, although it's 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 with love and probably different. <laughs> 
I think it's how you define workplace. I think during the industrial age, we definitely squeezed that connection that Patrick's talking about. But for a few billion years, I probably put a lot of time on it. We have developed that sense of community, that sense of taking care of each other. And in that, work? It, it, yeah, especially in work. It just wasn't working in a factory. It was working in a field, working on mm -hmm. the landlord's manor, working in our, our, our tribes, working, you know, so many different ways. We've worked mm -hmm. over the the hundreds of thousands of years um that just got squelched in the last 300 years or so <laughs> yeah. so that that's all I, that I, that's all I want to just mention to everyone um okay. I do want to take time while everyone's here to thank you Sophie on leading us on this conversation what landed with me as you said we need to focus on the big picture and you brought that um I think it was all summarized in the uber metaphor that you used where uber really thought about how to disrupt that that particular service and we really need to look at how we need to deliver or how our organizations need to deliver today. Rethink that, retool it, and then revise as we move forward. So thank you so much for that. Um, Pay, if, you, if you'd if you like to jump in and share your thought really quickly, that would be great. Sure, thank you. Um, so first of all, really enjoyed the session. Lots of great stuff. Um, I, my favorite part actually, and I'm seeing it sort of live day to day with the business that I'm building, is the fact that we are moving towards a gig economy and there's a lot of really great experts and folks that are not only in the industry, but have opted mm -hmm. out of the big machines um, and have gone on their own in different you know, businesses and independent consulting. Um, and you know, because I come from you know, multiple uh, generations of, of um, being with big four, big six management consulting, that whole idea of portfolio work and lifestyle, and being project based is is a tremendous way to live, um, and and it's interesting to see that more people are embracing that. So, um, it, it really enjoyed the, the the topics, and look forward to reading your 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 books and and your podcasts and stuff. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I do think I um this if if you if you're interested in this, so I typically say the the 1099 economy because I think about gigs as being much much shorter term. But the 1099, there's some really interesting work done by by MBO partners. They they do the state of independent the state of the independent worker, but also uh, the Hamilton project. Um, December 2015, they actually came out with something which was in between the W-2 and the 1099. I apologize to people who are not American, but this is in between somebody who is basically a part-time worker, a freelancer, and a full-time. They actually created, there was a proposition for something which was in between. So you could do collective bargaining, the company could, the, the worker could do collective bargaining, and the company could actually provide benefits. So it was like a middle ground. Very, very interesting, eight pages long, backed by all kinds, by academics. Um, it was actually, I think, one of the, the CEO of, of Lyft was one of the people who first uh, was sort of stimulated the idea, the P, P, private equity people in there. But very, very interesting, short read. Um, and ultimately, I think we probably have to go there, but it's a way it's further out. Love that reference. Uh, Stephen, not Stefan Butler, welcome. Thanks, David. Well, it's great to be back. And Sophie, I loved uh, your presentation and I'm going to have to follow you on LinkedIn. I guess I'll help you become an even bigger LinkedIn voice by a tiny increment. Um, I guess I said I had two, two, uh, one comment, uh, maybe they might both be comments actually, let's see how this comes out. Uh, on the topic of empathy, uh, so Sophie, I, as, as some of this group knows, I've recently written a book um, with, with an ex-Walmart executive about purpose in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And empathy came to be front and center. And part of our investigation, one of the things that was really interesting was um, going all the way back to Adam Smith, who basically said empathy, the human capacity for empathy is what makes markets possible. If we can't imagine what a customer might feel like, yeah. we're all wandering. There, there's no there's no <laughs> invisible hand, right? Nothing, right, no, right? nothing comes together. And, and I'll backdrop that with a comment I picked up from industrial psychologists uh, that we met along the way who said, you know, who has the great, first off, it was the distinction between cognitive and effective empathy, you know, mm -hmm. so the genuine kindness, you know, that Patrick talks about. Um, but the world's leading cognitive empathizers are con men because they know how to push your buttons. Right, manipulative, manipulative salespeople, absolutely. Manipulative yes. salespeople. So just so you don't you don't have to use it ethically. Agreed. You don't have to use it ethically, but I think that's and Smith would have said that's a that's a feature, not a bug. 
right? <laughs> the fact that you don't have to be a morally good person to conduct yourself with empathy, and you don't have to use empathy to pull off great frauds. Although I guess right. if you're going to pull off a fraud, <laughs> it's very helpful. Um, but I think that's an important thing for us to recognize. And to, to sort of segue into my the second part of my comment, um, and not, not coincidentally, because it's always, it's never too far away, this is the cover <laughs> of my book, you know, one yeah. you know, we have a wonderful graphic artist who who decided that it's heart key. You know that you know this is the key. You know, it is the key, right? Is yeah. being able to sort of connect on that level, trying to figure out what everything you've talked about is doing for the experience of the individual worker. Mm -hmm. Again, for me, and I'm somewhat biased because we we sort of have been on a six year journey that took us down this path. It's about helping individuals feel their own impact, right? Customers buy products because they want their emotional state to be changed. Employees mm -hmm. go to work because they want to make a difference. Whether you're an Uber driver making a joke that makes the person in the last person in the backseat laugh, as well as getting to the place on time, you just want to be you want to have impact. And I think that so much of what you brought to the table here and all all the various elements so you know wonderfully articulated are driving in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I'll just put one last comment. I think we may have talked about this when I had the privilege of presenting this group, and I don't want to take up too much more airtime, but I've had a lot of interesting conversations with folks who are in the AI space uh, recently, uh, particularly at Microsoft and at uh, Slack, um, about the ability to do sentiment analysis on company mm -hmm. chats. Yeah. And, you know, because in past, you want to know where you stood, you had to have a 360 review or, or do you know, do an employee survey or even a pulse survey was as small as we could get it. You can now ask a chat feed how your people are feeling or how mm -hmm. you stand. And that I think is going to be the most trans, not just a work experience, but I think the human life experience, the ability to ask an AI bot to tell you where you stand, which is the thing that we're all nervous about all the time, is going to be absolutely transformational. So that was my comment. Yes, and this incredible, thank you so much for those comments. I mean, this really interesting uh, technology is actually really good at reading people's faces, including on little screens, um, because some people are better and worse, either at showing their emotions or revealing their emotions. Some people have a sort of like, uh, you know, stiff upper lip type things, um, but also reading somebody else's face. And so technology can be helpful for, for that. Um, and so I really appreciate it. It's very interesting. Yes, I, I a friend of mine is a fantastic salesperson. And she said she has met some of some very empathetic and very manipulative salespeople. Um, in the end, for me, the thing that and my my book Empathy Works has like one paragraph about about that aspect of it. The key thing for me is is what's the long term. If you're going to take the long, have the long game in mind, you're not going to try and sell something that actually somebody doesn't want because it's not going to last. Like you're not going to be able to keep that. Um, keep that customer because you've sold them. You haven't actually tried to sell them something they want that that fits what you're trying to sell and fits actually their need. So that's kind of the way I try. The fraud and fraud is a bad strategy. Is basically yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Milton Friedman would agree with that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Thank you so much, Stephen. Hey, Jim, what's on your mind? Oh, as some of you know. Um, I'm uh, developing a uh, workplace well-being scenario. And um, the, the paradox is I've never worked for a corporation. I've always been a serial entrepreneur my whole career. So, And I'm a first-year baby boomer, so I've got 50 years in. And, um, and so I believe that, you know, what, what is paramount and that we aren't talking enough about is self-care. And I don't believe that uh, people are looking into themselves and saying, you know, and determining, you know, what's affecting them. You know, they always go to the doctor and they say, doctor, I don't feel good. You know, what, what's wrong with me? You know, and um, or, or diabetes, you know, if, if you knew if you knew about diabetes, you wouldn't be a diabetic, you know, so. Um, and as we are learning from sensory intelligence, you know, with how we understand our brain, we are now reducing the amount of dementia and Alzheimer's and autism we have because we're educating ourselves on, on self-care. And so in the workplace, self-care, um, 
certainly can go into effect in, in building culture. And what I'm working on is the fact that 75% of the corporations are now self-insured. So there's a natural door or pathway for the, uh, cor for the business owners or the corporations to engage with the uh, employee and make sure that there is a, uh, an honest uh, um, engagement uh, and concern. So, um, and again, you know, we are human, 55% of the population still resists change today. And as AI comes in, if we would just let AI happen and we all can keep up with it, the speed of which uh, this stuff is happening, it means that it's just a faster education. And, you know, our brain can handle it. You know, the question is, is whether our emotions can handle it. So I believe we need to put in a lot of work on self-care and uh, not worry so much about your neighbor. If you take care of yourself, your environment is going to grow and uh, and your relationships will grow. Well, Thank you, Jim. If I may build on that just for a second, one thing I didn't make enough of um, in the whole thing is about this idea of, for me, I have four principles of, of modern work, which is L-I-F-E, uh, learning, intention, flexibility, and empathy. And that intention piece of it is this, this need for every single one of us to be really intentionable, intentional about how we work how we're looking after ourselves, how we're engaging, how we're trying to run our careers, how we're trying, because it is all up to us now. It's not being taken out, of, uh, it's not being taken care of by the corporation. The, you know, the training isn't there for us. The upskilling isn't there for us. We're needing to take on so much of that ourselves. And self-care is a critical piece of it. Jim, you're, I completely agree with you um, because of how much is going on. And, and, and uh, yeah, so totally. What totally. was the, what was the F in life? Flexibility. <laughs> and what is the E? Empathy. Come on. Empathy. Guys. There you go. <laughs> the mother of invent empathy. Come on. Read the book. Read the book. Someone who reads a lot and shares it weekly, unless it's the summer, is Dan. Hello. Hello, Dan. <laughs> hey, Sophie. So when you were on our live show, I don't think we got to ask you about this, even though AI is pretty much taking over our editorial calendar. But with things happening at such a, an increasing clip now, with so much decision-making going on, with more team leadership and so forth, the question that I did not get to ask you, and I'm <laughs> going to ask you today, is what happens to the annual review? Does it go, does it go the way of the dodo bird? So the, the annual review for salary or promotion purposes stays. I mean, it, I mean when I first started in this space, it, you know, 2020, 2013, 2014, the reviews and performance was all in flux, and it still is to a great extent. And the people who are really getting it right in terms of, you know, focusing on results, whatever, they have a really good performance management system, and it is very, very hard. Coaching, like check-ins should best be 15 minutes every week. So the annual, I mean, and it might be a promotion needs to be in nine months because we're working at a faster pace because new graduates are coming in to jobs which are three to four years more advanced than when we started. So the really interesting article in the Wall Street Journal from 2019. So, um, but the, the once a year or periodic to, to look at salaries, um, and to to think about promotions or movements in order to help people progress and to know that they're going to progress, otherwise they will leave. Yes, but that coaching, the that facilitation has to be happening ongoing for sure. Yeah, that's exactly what uh, Stephen Butler just dropped in the chat, right? So you're you're doing it all the time, but he threw in an educational component, the idea that there's a there's a feedback loop so especially when things are growing so crazy i mean yeah. can you imagine where I, I love looking at some of the old mosh pits when ai is not even mentioned and now we we're, we're yeah. inundated right it's it's doubling it's doubling every day everyone's uh, getting in uh, it absolutely insane but the feedback loop to educate 
people and more of that education coming from people that are less than 10 years in the industry, I would think is going to be increasingly critical. Right. And the listening, it's so important to be listening to the younger people who may have some really great ideas about how the technology be, be, may be used or what they've been seeing. If you're trying to, if you, if one of your markets is to be selling to younger people, you need to understand their, their mindsets in order to be able to sell to them. Like, you know, but that that's, you know, period. Um, so this feedback loop, because KPIs also are continually changing. Sorry, not continually changing, but they are shifting and um, and also transparency that goes with that to make sure that people are making decisions and have the information they need on an ongoing basis and that they don't get, you know, people aren't left out of the loop and then decisions are made because people aren't sharing enough information so that a lot of things that that were, you know, information used to be power and it used to be at the tip, the tippy top, right? The people always had the power at the top. Now, you know, we need to be spreading information and sharing that. So there are lots of uncomfortable changes for existing leaders, people who have sp spent 30 years getting to the top of their organization. This is very challenging territory. And uh, hey, Sandra, to your point, I, I think th there's so many aspects of doing the review. It's not necessarily to promote somebody. It's, it's also to see where they're at relative to a product line or a service line. And, you know, maybe there's a better role for them, uh, somewhere else, or maybe they need to do that cross training so they can be ready for this next X that you have in mind. I think these reviews are just check-ins more and more. Yes. And then and the rating, Sandra. So I don't know if you know that 2013, there was this really interesting Deloitte uh, review that was done. And, and basically it showed that 80% of ratings were based on the person doing the rating. And so they threw everything out. Then they brought some of it back in again. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, they brought, because you, throwing your ratings out completely was too hard. Um, so performance management is still challenging. <laughs> But we've got to do that that way, right? Because you want to keep the people that are yep. producing. <laughs> and you can't, and how do you measure the, the non-1099 uh, mm -hmm. crowd? How do you measure all of the people that are in, in product marketing, as an example? You know, how did their, them going to the customer, grabbing some information, helping a, a key pivot, and then it's thrown into a campaign? How, how do they get recognized? So there's so, mm -hmm. so much there. And some very interesting. So, um, if you, the, I, I interviewed this woman, um, Jenny He, who is uh, about productivity. She has um, 400 employees, and there are some groups like product product management and engineering. Um, she they evaluate them on, on a team basis because they cannot do it on an individual basis because there is no team output. Um, so it's a really interesting um, interview with her, like getting into the nitty gritty of, of how she very, otherwise I don't like talking about productivity at all. I can't stand, it's, it's so people, most people don't, don't get calculated effectively for each different sort of group. Yes. Jamal, how do you respond to the comment surveys are doomed? I was just uh, commenting to Susan's um, question about how many people answer questions. I, I think, I don't think that's, that's a loaded question. So first off, personally, I think surveys for the most part suck, but I don't think that self-reported information is bad. Mm -hmm. um, I think self-reported information is critical. It's just the matter of how we source said self-reported information. I think prioritizing to, to Susan's direct comment on how many people answer surveys honest all the way through, very few. But if you prioritize how they um, think, work, act, then you can ask them about the things that really matter to them and get some really deep insights that lend to your programs. That's what I think, David. Thank you. I love that. Hey, Jamal, you must love today because it's like a Canadian invasion. <laughs> Brian from Toronto, what is going on? I'm just curious to hear Sophie's comments and others about, you know, where the evolution of prop tech AI. And as you think about asynchronous work and people collaborating and co-creating on a document, you have co-pilots and AIs overseeing all this interaction, who's inputting what, who's contributing to an output that can actually measure what your contribution is. You know, that to me becomes part of your evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quantified, right? You can't like data, as they say, if done properly, doesn't 
lie, so to speak. Um, that's part of uh, a review in the future. It goes hand in hand with other aspects of emotion, empathy, compassion, and other things that we're talking about. But it's a quantitative and a qualitative component to review that becomes much more real, right? But but Brian, I would I would ask you because I think it's that's it's a really interesting point. But if you and I and David and Jamal are in a team, how how do we know and, and AI? How do we know who's contribution was most valuable that was the critical spark that actually made the idea what it what it does i mean i think there is data but how we interpret that data and how we value each individual input then becomes important so the really interesting thing for me which is part of this interview that i did with jenny in order for teams that are evaluated on a team basis she goes around and this is a killer question she says to each person, to, sorry, to the leader, which person on, how would you feel if um, Brian were not on your team anymore? How would you feel about how the work would get done? And then it goes to the next person. How would you feel if Dan were not on your team? How would that, how would the work get done? And she uses that to, to help people understand how people feel about the contribution. This is an engineering team. So um, again, so it's this, there's quantitative data and there's qualitative data and it's not that easy. <laughs> no, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's easy stuff, but I think there'll be more, much more inputs to provide greater insights, right? Yep. In the future. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So if I can just jump in on, on that group point, um, I think one of the most interesting thing that, um, you know, we're a group based species, right? We've only survived as far as we've got, right? The reason why we didn't get killed off, you know, hundred thousand years ago, is that we learn to work in teams, and that's maybe more of our natural. Like Charles Taylor, the philosopher, would would back me up on this. This is as opposed to Charles, the Liberian dictator. Um, <laughs> but, but this is this is um, you know, it's the fact that we would live and work in groups. I'm not sure the question of who is the most important member or how much are we contributing. It's a little bit like asking what's the most important ingredient in this cake. Or, you know, or you know, right, that I need right. to start whatever. It, it all works together. But I think one of the fascinating things that we're going to start witnessing, and, I, and I'm just going to leave a comment because I've got a client waiting for me on another line. But I think that this, the, we're going to learn about like, you know, today our ability to survey and ask ourselves and evaluate performance is all based on these very blunt instruments that most of us hate. We have a new instrument coming in that's less blunt, but it is still blunt. And we're probably going to spend the next five to 10 years figuring out how AI based surveys of like, you know, Zoom workplace would probably give a summary of how, how this discussion has gone. Um, and to figure out, and, and like anything out of AI so far, it'll just give us something to work with. Mm -hmm. And we still need to layer our thinking on top of that. Um, so Stephen, I, I, Stephen I, before you go, yeah. try, have a look at trickle.com. Trickle.com? Trickle, okay. Yeah. Trickle. It's a, it's an um, Scottish company. And they it's they do it anon anonymously to begin with to stimulate uh, people sharing data and then mm -hmm. the 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 number of people that actually uh, they use it in the NHS they use it um, in, in lots of different companies but um, the the level of when people trust that their voices can be heard and that people are going to do something about it then the number of people giving their feedback on on anonymously goes down. And so you yeah. get this very, it sort of triggers trust. It's really interesting. And that I'll can be, it one of the, it's, it's a, it's an interesting idea. A comment. So a comment I heard funnily enough from the very client that I'm making weight right now was they were, they've always been concerned about the gaming of these systems, right? Cause as we know, any set of rules can be gamed. That's mm -hmm. part of the joy of life, actually. It's, it's actually not necessarily a bad thing, but, but figuring out how to game, for example, when you're in an interview that's being videotaped for an hour, people lose their ability to game. Right. We see, you know, mm -hmm. we see this sort of truth come through. That's another interesting question. But anyway, with respect to this whole group, thank you very much, Jamal, David, and particularly Sophie yourself. Um, uh, I'm going to have to drop off. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's okay. official. Yeah. We just lost our first Canadian. And now we go to a, <laughs> now we go to another. Sandra, what is going on here? Why do Canadians answer this question first? Why do Canadians find the mosh pit so fascinating? <laughs> And I'm sorry I didn't have any Canadian data. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. We're used to it. We're used to like just being ignored. <laughs>
<laughs> it's good stuff. It's all good stuff. It's always, always informative. That's why we like it. Um, I just had a comment actually about um, about AI and just kind of the, where the conversation was going around, you know, how do you know who's most productive or I think just from the little bit of AI work that I've that I've done. And I mean, I've I've been sort of in the analytics space for quite some time and specifically over the last six years or so really focused on patterns, like just behavioral patterns. And obviously it's in workplace in a completely different realm, but it's been really interesting to watch how AI looks for patterns. And so when I think about just kind of the plethora of data that's out there and how when all this data comes together and the ability for uh, AI to sort of process that data and identify patterns. So thinking about the example of, you know, in a, in a team setting or you're looking for productivity or whatever it is that you're looking for, it's not going to be focused on just that specific task. I think there's going to be trends and patterns and things that would come up about certain people of how they work that basically lends itself to a persona or a sort of a certain way of working that is fairly consistent. Because that's one of the things that I've found in looking at patterns and data, especially when you're looking at data over long periods of time and you're looking at trending, is um, behaviors generally normalize over time. So we think it's very sporadic, but when you're monitoring data on a minute by minute basis, it's actually quite interesting how people behave the way people behave. And so I think that that's going to come through when and if we ever get to that point where you've got different data sets coming together that you get different perspectives of how people work, how people interact, that kind of thing, where it's good. You're going to see sort of, you know, who, who are the leaders and who are the ones that maybe need more coaching or, you know, and I'll give you an example. So um, when I joined Octospace back in February, so we're using a tool called Gong. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it or is using it, but poking around in there, it's, it's, it basically records your calls, right? So whether it's uh, peer calls, you know, coworkers or customer calls, we record everything because we work asynchronously. We're a virtual first company. And so I was poking around in there and I saw that there was an AI component to it. And what it does, it is actually, actually analyzes all of your calls. So since I started in February, it analyzes all of my calls and it gives me sort of a profile of my style. But then what's cool is it compares me to other people who have had similar types of calls. So customer call, like the way that it's all structured. So I think that that's quite fascinating and just kind of like a sneak peek, I think, of what's to come when it comes to workplaces. Some people might think that's creepy, like, you know, that you're recording every single call. We don't think that way because we find it useful to hear other people's calls because that's how we learn. Um, and so, yeah, that's just kind of what I what I wanted to add to the conversation. I'm curious, Sandra, is, do you find the, the persona um, summary accurate? I do. Okay. Yeah. Really? Because I have found so... The, in, the inaccuracies of many of the tools that I've used have been very frustrating to me. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's gotten better over time. So at the beginning, it was like, mm, I don't know about that. But it's been, you know, what, four months, five months that I've been with the company. I'm doing probably 10 to 12 calls a day. And so mm -hmm. everything is recorded. And so the more data you're feeding it, the better the results are that you're going to that you're going to get right. from it. And, and to the, me, I'm getting very, very specific prompts because I Without yeah. using words like verbatim, I get kind of like it making shit up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that's a that's a cue. I'm gonna stop the uh, the recording, <laughs> and, and Jamal will drop an f bomb if I don't. 